Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Annie and Kate. Uh, hi, Annie. Hello, hello. And our guest today is Elaine Stan. And hi. Annie, can introduce her. Welcome. Uh, it's always a joy, isn't it, when we have friends on the podcast. So this is awesome because I also get to learn something about a good friend of mine that I probably didn't know already. So I'm just even reading Elaine's bio. I'm like, really? That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Elaine is a venture capital investor. She's based in the beautiful Adelaide. Uh, her track record, has like 80 startups she's invested in across Australia, the US and Southeast Asia. She's a scientist turned entrepreneur turned VC. And honestly, you, it's like, how do you do all of those three things? I don't know how you do that. Um, she's invested in startups like uh, Venomofo, big fan of Venomofo, been a customer for many years, uh, Fluent Commerce, Hatch Tech, Pet Circle, gosh, the list is endless, Shoes of Prey, e-commerce, Shopback, I could keep going on, we'd be here all day. Um, she's also the uh, director of Cicada Innovations and, and an advisor to federal governments on the Entrepreneurs Programme. The list is so long of all of the accolades that Elaine has um, been involved in. Uh, she's been a huge supporter of the tech innovation system across Australia for many, many years. She's a hugely trusted advisor and investor. We're super, super lucky to have you on the show. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, ladies, and hi to everyone who's listening at the moment. All right, do you want to go for your first question, Kate? I will, I will. So I'm really interested to find out what you, if you do self-care and if you do what you do, because we're all sort of needing to do some self-care nowadays, I suspect. Yeah, no, we we absolutely are. And I I was worried you were going to ask me that question, Kate, because I, I am terrible at self-care, but um, <laughs> I've had to be slightly better at it these days than I used to be. So um I think, you know, it's pretty well known that um, I have had depression and anxiety and have battled that for quite a number of years. And so I think self-care when you're, when you're struggling with some of those things in the background is probably more important um, than, um, than it maybe ordinarily is. And I think added on top of that, everyone's battling a pandemic and there's lots of extra pressures and stresses on everyone at the moment. So I wish I could be more, um, uh, you know, I, uh, do, do as I say, not as I do <laughs> on this. But, um, but really the way that I deal with it is to have a lot of downtime. Oh, I can see Maxie in the background. That's awesome to see. Um, so, so for me, you know, a lot of my work is um, cerebral. It's in my head. It's talking to people. Um, and I'm not a natural extrovert. And so self-care for me at a primary level looks like just spending a lot of time alone. <laughs> because, um, but that's really me, great that you recognise that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so for me, it's sort of locking myself away with my dogs who um, really are so undemanding of my time, except for, you know, the occasional scratch and cuddle. Um, but it's spending a lot of time alone. And I know when I, like, I'm better at reading now when I'm burnt out from, from the extroversion or the talking to people part of my job. Um, and I like to do stuff that doesn't actually require me to think very much. And so, you know, it's watching Netflix. It's, you know, watching, in my particular case, it's for some reason watching true crime documentary series. That is my go-to from a self-care perspective. Um, but I also, you know, I do the other stuff, which is maybe, you know, a little bit more extreme, which is I, you know, see a psychologist all the time, because I think I just have, I'm, I have an extra requirement to kind of just make sure that I'm checking in with someone objective who can tell me, you know, if I'm starting to veer off, you know, the, I guess the worn path and into some areas that perhaps I shouldn't be walking into. And so I think those things all together um are probably the biggest component of like self-care for me dogs time alone watching serial killer true crime documentary series and and seeing a psychologist getting help should not be something that's you know sort of a taboo or a weird thing either it's you know um mum and i so my dad passed away recently and mum and i are kind of getting bereavement counseling because 
I've not done this before. Yeah, I, I don't know how to deal with that. Why yeah. should I think that I should magic up the tools to do that by myself when there are experts out there who can help you do it? So, Absolutely. Yeah, we should talk yeah. about therapy and counseling or, or psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever. If you need it, go get it. 100%. I just look at two of us are wearing glasses. Like we've got help for seeing, why don't we have help for mental health? You know, it's just the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that's been pleasing to see is that um, government has increased access to mental um, health care um, since the pandemic hit. So, for example, my mental health plan three years ago was you'd get sort of access to six visits with a psychologist or a psychiatrist or who whatever you needed for your mental health whereas now you get 12 in a you know in a yearly calendar um, year period so it's good to see that there has been a recognition that this is an absolutely essential service that that Australians need to have the ability to access if they so desire and you're right Annie people talking about it more openly and doing so in a way that isn't taboo um, encourages you know, more people, I think, to try and exactly do that, Kate. You know, you get a prescription for your, for your, um, for your eyesight. Why wouldn't you get a prescription for your head to make sure that, you know, everything is as it should be? Yeah, yeah really good. Hey, what are we drinking? <clears throat> so I am drinking a local Adelaide Hills, um, uh, I think it's actually a GSM. Yeah, sorry, I should have checked that before you asked me about it. <laughs> a nice red anything from south australia is good You've got so many good vineyards down there i know we're so lucky and we get to visit them at the moment that's the even luckier part i'm very jealous of you i haven't <laughs> left my very small village for yonks <laughs> what are you on annie uh i i'm uh, on my obviously it's morning for me here so i'm on my big old mug of uh, Yorkshire gold tea. I've just discovered Yorkshire gold. It's delightful. It is lovely, isn't it? It's sort of got a big, warm, multi hug. It's really good. It's really good. I'm drinking a gin and tonic, with, which is um, a lovely gift from my friend, my lovely friend, Selena. Um, and it's called the Suburban. And it's an Australian contemporary gin with dandelion, prickly pear, blackberry and fennel. Wow, quite the mix. Mm. Yeah, it's very tasty. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> my uh, starter question for you, Elaine. If you could go back to your younger self and give your younger self some advice, what would that advice be? Oh, um, I think there would be two things. One would be um, to relax <laughs> because you know, one thing that's plagued me since I was very little was anxiety. And, um, and in many ways, I think it was a positive thing, but the devil is in the dose, right? And so um, I think it has been a net negative for me. And so um, I guess one of my bits of advice would be to try and tell myself to relax. But I also say that knowing that there is absolutely no way if someone had told me to relax. I would have been able to relax but I really you know if I think about my young self with some sort of empathy and nurturing like that's what I would want to say to her is just to just like let it go kid um the stuff that you're worrying about or the stuff that you think is um so critical to your peace of mind doesn't matter in in broad scheme of things I think you probably get I would have said probably I would have said go see a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think you get a different perspective as you get older and you look back. Uh, you know, you don't you don't oh, know what you don't know. Do. No, you absolutely do. And I, I mean, I had my parents who would say the same thing to me. But and this is how I know it wouldn't have mattered if I'd said this. But um, yeah, so perhaps perhaps if I was to answer that more accurately, it would have been. To say go get some um go get some psychological help earlier i think that would have changed my trajectory quite a bit and not be so um uh, wary of doing that i think what why do you think you were wary of it 
Is it just sort of the social stigma of it or? Yeah, so I thought, um, so it took me a really long time to work out that I had an anxiety disorder. So I just thought I was highly strong or um, uh, highly ambitious or, um, it, so for me, it, it didn't really register that I had a mental health issue until I was in my 20s. But and and it was only when I had my sort of first what I call kind of nervous breakdown, um, which was really just a burnout, right? Um, and and that forced me to go see a psychologist. That it was the first time someone had said, actually, I think you've got an anxiety disorder, and it made everything from like six years old and onwards just go click 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 click. Like it just it all fell into place and. Um, so I think that was actually the thing. It wasn't so much a stigma. It's that I didn't actually realize that I was, um, sort of an ab aberrance from, from the mean. I just thought this is just, you know, how people are wired and, and I just happen to be very anxious. Um, but you know, stuff like, uh, you know, I, I was convinced for the majority of my childhood that my parents were gonna die in a car accident and I would be orphaned. And I know that's a very real thing that most children are um, scared of, but I was hyper vigilant and scared of it. And I was hyper vigilant and scared of the dark, for example. So I would not sleep at night. I would go to bed and stay up the entire night because I was convinced that, um, you know, a, a, a child abductor was going to break into my house and, and steal my sister and I. And, you know, just this stuff, which kids, you know, absolutely happens to children. But I think when you, when it blows up into something that stops a child from sleeping or um, makes them mortally afraid that their parents are going to abandon them, like that's the stuff that morphs into that's not normal. Yeah. And I just never, it, it never occurred to me <laughs> that that wasn't normal. And, um, and then as you grow up, those things just morph into different things that happen to follow you according to your age. And so it turned into an eating disorder when I was in my teens. And, um, you know, so it was just one of those, I think that it wasn't so much a stigma. Once, once it became very clear that I needed um, medical attention, I was happy to go get it. It just never occurred to me that I needed it. Mm. Fascinating. And hey, let's let's take it switch directions a little bit. What got you into um, you know sort of a science kind of background? That first? was what I was thinking too. I, know, I want to know where, how you started on your your path into science, but then how you flipped from that into investing because that's like two very different career tra trajectories. Yeah, it it sounds like it's two very different career tra trajectories, but actually it's not that different but um so look I was a you know a very academic child and you know, I was always um like I loved school I was one of those kids who loved school <laughs> I loved going to school I would get out of bed in the morning and be so excited to go to school I would ask my teachers for homework in you one like I was just such a nerd and um I'm nodding, but, by the way, I'm nodding. I, I, I feel it. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, uh, totally. Totally. I'm it was like, it. absolutely. I was proud of it too and still am, but I genuinely liked it. And it, it was a very different experience to my sister who genuinely did not like school. And it wasn't because she wasn't um, smart. She just had, like, I just had this dream run of teachers, I think. And like, I just was, I just had a very, um, uh, privileged gifted um you know blessed time at school and so for me it was a very positive thing um I always loved the sciences I had some amazing science teachers and I think as you go on through you know primary school and high school and you, you sort of narrow down your um interests it was always the sciences for me and so when I finished school and was trying to work out what I wanted to do at university I was actually thinking I would come back and be a science teacher that was actually what I wanted to do. And so 
the easiest way to do that was to do science first, a science degree first, and then I was going to go into a teaching degree. Um, and once you get into that science degree and you start to sort of dig a bit deeper into various different topics, it was just, you know, it was utopia for me. Um, and I kind of got to the end of that degree and I didn't want to go do teaching. I just thought, oh, maybe I'll be a scientist. Even though that what, was what never... What kind of science? What were you interested in? So biology was my kind of first love, I guess. So at university, I did physics, I did maths, I did chemistry, I did, you know, all of that stuff. But I think as I kind of went on in my science degree, kind of narrowed down into the um, life sciences. So that was kind of focus for me. Um, I ended up majoring in biochemistry and immunology and microbiology, but I went on and did an honours degree in biochemistry because um, that was kind of my, my, I guess, my real passion at the time. And then once they get you into that honours degree kind of stream, um, the, the way that universities are set up is there's no other path for you. It's all, it's, you're now going to be a research scientist. Um, I think it's a bit different now, but sort of 20 odd years ago when I was going through, it was very, it was very blinkered, which was do an honours degree, go and do a PhD. Once you finish your PhD, you go and do a postdoc in an excellent lab in Europe somewhere. And then you come back and you apply for a fellowship and you become a very famous scientist in Australia. That was <laughs> like your, your path and it was a very well-worn path. But I got to the, and I did my honours degree and it was great and I loved it. And, you know, I had such a fantastic research experience that I decided to do a PhD. And then my first year of my PhD, I had completed a year and the, and the um, I guess the area that I was researching, um, another lab in Europe scooped us and published exactly the same thing that, that I was doing in my PhD. So I had to start again. Oh, that's such so, good luck. Yeah, yeah. Well, it could have happened later, right? So in oh, a yeah. way it would... It's better it to happen the first year than third. Yeah, but it meant my PhD took five years instead of sort of three and a half. And, and then it was just a slog. Like it was, it was a slog because of that, you know, just a whole bunch of other reasons. But I kind of got to the end of my PhD and I just knew that I did not want to be a research scientist. And as much as I loved this science and, um, you know, the, the theoretical part of what we were doing, I did not love sitting at a bench, doing experiments, um, and the particular experiments I did would have, would have to go for like 48 hours and I'd have to do them in a cold room and I wouldn't be able to go to sleep for 48 hours. And, you know, it was just, um, it was brutal. And that's normal. Like, you know, that wasn't anything particularly um, heroic, but it just made me realise, okay, like if I have to do this for the rest of my life, I am going to wither into a... <laughs> you know so I just was like it's not for me so um then I started to think well what you know I don't want this whole trajectory of you know a science degree an honours degree a PhD to be for naught um how do I try and still use this for something that um you know could could sort of be a platform for my career and actually during my PhD we um my group um had filed a whole bunch of patents on the work that we were doing, which eventually got licensed to a biotechnology company, including one that I was a inventor on. And that kind of introduced me into the commercial side of research, uh, which really was my first introduction into that whole world. And that was for me, the first time I saw that there was like a business side to research. And I thought, oh, you know, because I'd, worked in retail for like, you know, 12 years, you know, while I was doing my PhD and before I was like a, you know, as much as I'm not an extrovert, I was kind of good in that job. And I sort of loved that um, sales aspect of it. So I thought, well, maybe there's a way I can marry these different backgrounds and find a way to, to find a path in this world where I can still use that background, but, and it not be a waste. And so 
um, eventually I ended up uh, working for that biotechnology company and then um, joined the University of Adelaide not long after in their technology transfer um, office which I started out as an intern and then spent five years there, ended up being deputy director. And it was just the greatest apprenticeship for me because I got to use my background to help work with academics, to help them understand the pathway to commercialization. And, but it, I had to do this in such a fast fashion, almost like fast fashion where, you know, you have to work out very quickly whether this plant variety has got commercial impact or this defense technology has got an ability to be commercialized with, you know, defense crimes or, um, and it was just a raft of different technologies and areas. And I loved that. What, what that really made me understand was, while well, I'd spent my entire academic career narrowing my focus into this one area that I understood very deeply, the thing that really made me excited was being able to work across a broad spectrum of technology areas, um, but apply these principles, which were pretty straightforward across them. Do you have a market opportunity? Are you solving a real problem? Are there, you know, is this ready for someone to kind of receive it and, and run with it? Or do you need to continue to develop it further? Um, and, and I was sold from then. And so that was what sort of flipped me into the commercial side. Um, but then to cut a long story short, <laughs> I ended up spinning out a company and, um, and running that as, as CEO for a little while and raised venture capital through that process for that company. And that kind of introduced me to the venture capital part of that whole baton relay of, you know, you've got innovation, then you've got, you know, the whole early stage commercialization side, then you've got the risk capital side. Um, and one of the venture capital firms that I pitched to ended up recruiting me and, and then I've been in that ever since. And have you, you know, sort of on that question point now, you've been in venture capital ever since, is it that variety of just, you know, because it sounded like when you, your eyes lit up when you started to talk about, you know, I'd got to work this out really quickly and had to have an opinion on it really quickly and, and you know, venture capital is, is obviously very similar. Um, is that what it is that sort of keeps you entertained and engaged, that variety? Yeah, I think variety is part of it. And um, the other part is I, qu I quite like solving problems. <laughs> so, um, and I feel like um, if you're a part of the entrepreneurial ecosystem, regardless of the role that you play, whether you're an entrepreneur or venture capitalist or um, any, anyone who plays a role, you're helping to try and solve a problem. And the problem is different every day. And I do absolutely think that variety makes a huge difference to my interest levels. But I do like, just from a you know, cerebral perspective, I like problem solving. But the other part of it is I like building things. So um, I think the reason why this particular ecosystem, um, I, I have been engaged with it for such a long time, is it feels good to be involved in something that is genuinely trying to build things. Like we're trying to build new businesses. We're trying to solve new problems. We're creating jobs as we do it. Um, there is something very, um, oh, I hate to use this word, but it's the only one that's coming to me right now, fecund about it. Like it's, um, there's nothing destructive about it. Yes, you might be disrupting industries, but it's all about um, creation and growth. And I just love being associated with that. It's addictive, isn't it? Mm, yeah, it is. Yeah. But in a good way, right? Because you're genuine. Uh, you know, I think, I think most people are involved in this sector because they like to feel that they're having an impact and that impact is a positive or a constructive impact. Um, and that doesn't mean it's always constructive and there's no... Um, attrition along the way or no failure along the way but I think generally we're all trying to build and create things we're not trying to tear things down yeah I, I enjoy inventing the future that's how I describe it yeah that's a great way to frame it Kate inventing the future I love that yeah so when you oh go for it Kate sorry oh, no I, I was just going to ask you 
what what what's been the most surprising thing about what you do though? What what what's the most surprising and perhaps delightful thing about it? Um. So the I, I don't know if it's surprising, but the, the the delightful thing about it has been all of the amazing people that are involved in this sector and this ecosystem, and just how most of them are so genuinely good and genuinely trying to make a positive impact. And, um, and that's been delightful. I'm not sure that's been surprising, but it's absolutely been the greatest delight of being involved in this space. Um, I think the thing that's surprising in the opposite way is that there are just, <laughs> it is still just particularly venture capital. It's just, um, it's still a hard place that's full of sometimes greedy people who don't have the best interests at heart. And, and that still shocks and surprises me, even though I've been in this industry for such a long time. Um, so yeah, people have surprised me on both ends of the spectrum mm -hmm. the entire time. As they do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't want to go into the court case and anything else around it but I do want to ask you one thing what made you go and defend yourself and do it in such a you know public way when you knew it was going to take a lot out of you what what pushed you to back yourself and by the way I'm bloody glad you did <laughs> um but just that must have been such a tough decision um sorry in the end, it wasn't a hard decision um, because I think it's what happens, in my case, it's what happened when I was backed into a corner where I had, um, I had no other option. So uh, I had no other option and I had nothing to lose except to go down this path to try and set the record straight. So for me... It, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a difficult decision. It was actually, um, it was the easiest decision I made. In fact, it was something I had wanted to do for quite a long time but wasn't allowed to. So finally, where it got to a point where I just thought, um, this is going to keep happening and unless I stand up for myself <laughs> and try and correct the record. Um, and I didn't have any other option. So I felt like it was a um, less of a decision that I was given more than, uh, and it was more of a decision I just had to make. Right. Well, like I say, I'm so proud of you for what you did. I think I can't imagine how tough it must have been. Yeah. No, it was like, no one wants to be in litigation, right? Like it's horrible. And, um, but I think when you, when you feel very strongly that you've got um, a, a different story that needs to be told and you're confident about, um, you know, laying yourself open and having everything interrogated, which I was, right? And I think that's the, the thing that was, um, you know, gets overlooked, right, is that um, I don't think people go through defamation cases willy-nilly. It's very expensive <laughs> it's, um, and it takes a lot out of you. So you really only do it unless you genuinely think that you've been wronged and you're prepared to have everything, kind of have your entire self and all of your details flayed open for the public to see. And, um, and I just knew if that happened that I would be okay. Like I, I felt like I was in... Um, I, I felt like I was right. And so I really was happy to move forward. Was that just sort of you just sort of taking control of your own story back a bit? It definitely was part of it, Kate. So for a long time and still now, um, I have such a large amount of shame with that whole process. And um I don't have guilt because I didn't do anything wrong, but I absolutely have shame where the difference between guilt and shame is one is I did a bad thing and shame is I am bad. 
And the reason I felt a lot of shame is because I had someone telling me every single day that I am bad. Mm. I had someone in the public domain telling every one of my peers that I'm a terrible person. I was stupid. I was a prodigious destroyer of capital. I was, you know, all of these things. And I think there's very few people who could read that or listen to that without absorbing the shame of that. And um, even if it's not deserved. Mm. So, and I feel like the only antidote to shame is to shine some light on it and to tell your story um, and to do it publicly. So that's taking control of the narrative. And the only way that I could take control of the narrative, like I don't have the same distribution that a national, one of two national newspapers in our country have. Like I could say whatever I want, but nowhere near the same number of people would see it. Yep. I needed a, an, a, an objective court to see everything and, and speak on my behalf. That's what I needed. So in order to get the, the, to have some control over that narrative. And that's why I say to, to Annie's question, like I didn't really have a choice mm. in the end. Like if I wanted to continue to um, ha hold my head up in our professional circles, I had to do that or else I had to find something else to do. <laughs> and I'm really not that good at anything else. So um, <laughs> I really didn't have a choice. Yeah, well, uh, unlike some of the recent defamation cases, I'm very happy at the outcome of this one. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I think I know which one you're referring to. <laughs> <laughs> um so let's let's go to something a little bit more positive what do you when you're looking to your future now um you've already done some incredible things what is it that keeps getting you out of bed you know you get, you sort of talked about yourself as a kid going i'm going to school i'm jumping out of bed i'm off you know what no. is it that keeps you going now so it, it's something very similar, but um, so the things that I do now are just as diverse as um, before, but in a broader scope of things. So um, I work with the Entrepreneurs Program. Um, I work with universities. I manage um, investments on behalf of a family office. So, and I sit on a couple of boards and some investment committees for various venture capital funds. So they're all different, I guess, stages of that same baton relay, which is how do you take something that's a fairly nice an idea and how do you convert it into something that has genuine impact? But I get to play a whole bunch of different roles along the way. Um, and that's what excites me again. So it's not very different. Um, I'm pretty... Uh, pretty simple in that regard like I've just got a variety of things that I get to work on but it's all working towards this building creating growth you know jobs um as Kate said uh, you know helping to create our future that's the stuff that gets me really excited um and I like that it's all very challenging like none of it is easy none of what you guys do is like it's <laughs> like it's all very tricky but that's the um, that's the cool challenging part of it is that we're trying to figure this all out ourselves collectively together and it's not straightforward or else if it was super straightforward everyone would be doing it um, yes. that's the that, like it's like a it's there's an there's a um, an intellectual element to it there's a competitive element to it um, and there's a huge kind of impact element to it. And I think it's those three things together that make it super in and still interesting and engaging to me. I don't know. What, like, what do you guys, how do you guys feel about it? Like, you're in the same sphere. So I'm keen to hear how you think about it too. We've, 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 we're working on a new startup together. <laughs> ah, there you go. Kind of stealth mode at the moment. <laughs> we need to talk to you about it actually afterwards. Um, okay. Look, it's the same thing, isn't it? Um, I mentioned earlier on, it is addictive. When you see your help helping literally in front of your eyes, whether it's you know a piece of advice or a connection that you've been able to open up for somebody or, or just literally seeing a business grow. And one of the things I love after eight and a bit years of being in Australia is seeing the companies that 
originally kind of started eight years ago who are now doing so well and that is just it's amazing like, isn't it it's just the energy that you get from that is so positive and like you say Elaine you know that nothing bad really comes from that it's only goodness right. and even yeah. if there's failure it's still goodness right yeah, particularly it's if it's honest failure well, you know, you know, one of, one of my startups, you know, we, we, we just had really bad timing because it was a China based thing and tr Trump just started his trade war with China. Uh, you can't predict those kind of externalities, but, you know, it was a really interesting experience. I met some great people. It was really fun. And there's so many startups, for example, that have probably died because of the pandemic, right? And no one can look at them and say, well, you're a terrible business. It was just this, you know, sometimes businesses are just really vulnerable to these external events that they have absolutely no control over. And, you know, the pandemic, I think, is, has exposed that for a lot of companies. And it's the same as the example you just said, Kate. Like, sometimes timing just sucks. <laughs> yeah, well, one of my neighbours opened a wine bar just before COVID, you know, just really bad timing. And there's no thing you can do with a wine bar that is digital. So, no, no. And I think the other thing is what you, the, the network that you build over the course of that life cycle is just extraordinary. And, and I've met people who I would never have been able to, to get in touch with, you know, as a result of the, you know, being in the startup space. Um, so yeah, I, I just love that. It's the variety I'm with you on that one. It's uh, but it's the seeing the help, help, and also just the incredible people that you get to meet along the way. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Like these just extraordinary people doing extraordinary things and doing so in the most it, most of the time in the humblest of fashions. Hmm. You know, like no one would have heard about what they're doing or building but for the fact that we happen to be in this industry and you sort of, it's small and you hear about it. Like, I think it's extraordinary and it's a privilege to be part of it. It's a privilege and it is something that, you know, we all love dearly, but we also know it's kind of still a bit broken. Um, oh, for yeah. sure broken. <laughs> there, are, there are things that still need fixing. So I have one other question for you, Elaine. I'm going to give you a magic wand and you get to fix one thing in the in the tech space what would you like to see in australia bit? or worldwide well up to you you can choose whether it's around the world or whether it's just australia oh, look my my obvious answer to that question is um diversity so you know i think uh the 80 20 rule what's the one thing that you could do that would have you know 80 percent of the impact and i think it would be to change our um views around diversity and wave a magic wand to have a greater representation of diversity and i don't just mean gender i mean in every sort of representation have greater diversity at all levels of the baton relay right so it, particularly in decision making um positions I think that would that would supercharge um, and catalyze everything and um, it would get us it would level us up um, and save us 20 years I'm pretty sure but um, unfortunately I don't think where there's a magic wand that's going to make that happen anytime soon Annie like I think that particularly you two ladies are great advocate advocates for that um, but uh, we're sorely lacking. What is it that's holding us back? Oh, by the way, that's Ginny in the background. She's just had Ginny! a Ginny! Hello. She's just been <laughs> rubbing herself on all of the furniture to get dry thing. I'm surprised my dogs aren't in here at the moment. Um, Ginny. Uh, sorry, what was your question, Annie? Why do we not what is it? it? What is it that's holding us back so much? Why is it that it's still going to take another 20 years to get there, do you think? I'm sorry, I'm just going to say men. I don't, I'm sorry, Elaine. I know she oh, asked. Look, we may have probably one. That's, that's mum as well. Say hi, mum. Hi, mum. Hi, mum. <laughs> I'm Mrs. Parker. Oh, dear. Uh, carry on, Zio. Is it, is it just 
that um is it the laziness of men is it the deliberacy of they don't want diversity in the space i'm, I'm fascinated because it's it's sort of one of those things that we all know that diversity is going to be better for everybody it's going to be more profitable the products that we design are going to be better the solutions that end up in market will be better it's like what wh why would you deliberately hold back from that because it requires proactive um action and so for example the first most confronting way that we need to fix diversity is a whole bunch of men in power need to step aside and that's really hard right so where there's the biggest decision makers is still very um, white and male and, and misogynist. Like, that too. But but you, you, we're trying to change it at the moment. And, and even the sort of people who claim that they're, you know, pro diversity are trying to change it from the bottom of or the top of the funnel instead of the decision makers. So it's not the top of the pyramid, it's the bottom. So you know, for example, let's say in VC, if you are trying to change your gender equity by um, hiring more associates that are um, female and you have to wait 15 years for them to work their way up to partner, well, that is going to take a long time. But in order to change the people making decisions at the top, someone at the top has to step aside. Mm -hmm. That's really hard to force or ask people to do. And... Mm -hmm. That's why I think it's hard at the moment and we're seeing very slow changes because I think all of the changes coming from the ground up, not from the top down. And, and that's, that's a really good point. And I think, you know, we probably need the change to come from both ends of it. Yeah, and I think there are some, you know, there are some amazing allies out there who've taken a different path. So, for example, one who I'm... Um, you know, constantly impressed by is Justin Ryan from, um, he, he used to be with Quadrants Growth Fund. Um, so that was their closest to a VC fund. He was the managing partner there. Grew that fund, this private equity fund to, you know, I think it was 500 million. It's done extraordinarily, extraordinarily well. He invested in a lot of female founded businesses. That was considered quite unusual for a private equity firm. So Adore Beauty was one, Modi Body was another that he invested in. Um, and then he stepped aside. He stepped aside from running that fund. And guess what? He stepped out and how he's partnered with Kate Morris from Adore Beauty to run their own venture slash private equity fund. So it's that sort of stuff that I think is very hard for the people at the top to make a decision to do but you see those examples where they have done it. He stepped aside, stepped out of that fund, and now he's created a fund where he's 50-50 diversity at the partner level. And their purpose is to invest in female-led businesses or ones that at least have 50-50 diversity at a gender level. That's the stuff that you need, but it takes a very brave person to do that. And I just think that's an amazing example of what needs to happen from a proactive level um, in order to really change it quickly. Otherwise, we're going to be here in 20 years and we'll inch up, you know, by 5% or 10% here or there. And um, it'll all make a difference, but it'll just be slow and incremental. Yeah. Oh, look, we've, we've got work to do, but it, there is progress. And I think we do need to kind of remind ourselves that things have improved. Um, because we, we've got to keep going. We can't stop. You know, change is hard. Absolutely. But it's no, no, change is hard. And I think you said previously, Annie, it's hard and painfully slow, um, which is just something you have to realise so that you don't give up. But you've just, we, you know, I think we've all just got to keep pushing. But I don't know. I saw Grace Tame speak recently um, as Australian of the Year, and, um, and it was an extraordinary extraordinary speech um and I looked around everyone in the room and it was 95 percent female and mm. I just thought you're preaching to the converted yeah 
Yeah. Right. Um, that's that's part of the challenge. I, I, I'm conscious that that if we just think about the technology adoption curve, we're probably early adopter type people, and the bulk of the people are back in the laggard spot. You know, so and a lot of a lot of the people at the top of organisations are probably in the laggards group too. You know, so. They don't have a propensity to embrace change at the best of times. No, and it requires self-sacrifice in order mm -hmm. to do it, right? And I don't think many people outside of, I think our little ecosystem in startup world is not representative, is a bit of a bubble. It's not representative of how the rest of the world behaves mm -hmm. and reacts. And I think we need to acknowledge that in the rest of corporate Australia, um, asking someone to step aside from their incredibly influential, very powerful job <laughs> in order to make way for someone who, um, who, who deserves that role but um, perhaps might have missed out for cognitive bias or, you know, whatever bias, um, is a big ask. It requires some heroism, I think. Or it could just be solved with money. If you gave them the same money for stepping aside as for staying in the role, would they go? Maybe we need know. a fund for that. I don't know. I think it's, um, yeah, look, I mean, obviously if I had the answers, we'd solve it. But um, yeah, well, you <laughs> I just think uh, it, it absolutely relies on people with power conceding um, that power and that's that's really hard. I think history has shown that that doesn't happen easily. Well, we could just fight them for it. Right, which is what happens, but that's why it's slow and it's going to take, you know, a few more decades. I think what did we get to now? We've got at least every ASX 200 board is that's no longer 100% male. Yeah. And that was quotas established in like 19... 90 something I think so like it takes a long time and well it took the threat of quotas they 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 didn't put quotas on but they were threatened with quotas and they all said no 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 we can do it leave it to us and they they did because they didn't want anyone to impose it on them so you know the threat of quotas is always a good thing I'm a yeah, huge I, fan of quotas I am too so um but Hence the reason why it's just incrementally painful. Mm. Well, it's hey, we can't leave. We can't leave the podcast on on a. a no, 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 we can't. We can't. <laughs> Come on, let's let's. Ask, what's what's the coolest piece of innovation you've seen recently? The one that's got you most excited, Elaine? Oh God, like there's so many, but um, I think the the group that is impressing me the most at the moment. Um, is a startup that's come out of the ANU called Quantum Brilliance. So their goal is to have a, essentially a the equivalent of a personal quantum computer. Wow. And the ability, and, and they basically achieved it. And um, the computational opportunity that that presents is pretty extraordinary. And probably is going, like if they get it right, it's going to be a game changer. So that, that stuff I find, you know, my golden retrievers just arrived. So, um, <laughs> that stuff I think is super exciting. And it's like, it's, it's the, you know, it's the leading edge stuff that I find most um, exciting at the moment. But there's still businesses that I see all the time that, I, that isn't necessarily leading edge from a research perspective. Like there's this new business silo, which is, you know, come out of the Start Mate program, which is psilocybin um, magic mushrooms um, company. That's not leading edge from a like a research perspective or from a clinical efficacy perspective. I think that stuff's been known for a really long time, but they're doing something really different, um, trying to bring that to the average consumer. And I think that's really exciting, right? So uh, again, like it, it's probably pretty obvious to the listeners that I find it pretty easy to get excited about these things. Um, but I think that just shows the breadth of um, kind of opportunity and um, the depth of the entrepreneur 
um, capacity that we have here in Australia. And I think what we're seeing with Canva and some of these other businesses that have gone on to do amazing things is that we'll see a whole bunch of um, well-capitalised um, management coming out of those companies that will be that will be really experienced and able to invest in this next generation of companies as well. And I, my hope is that we'll just see that being this flywheel, this virtual virtuous cycle, where a number of this next generation will get access, won't find it quite so hard as the generation before, you know, because they'll have access to these amazing networks and um, and people who've been there done that. They're not doing it for the first time, and that excites me too. Well, that seeing that means. multiplier effect, isn't it? That the sort of the multiplier effect of not just the investment dollars, but the knowledge, the access to talent, advisory, literally everything is starting to sort of have this exponential growth. It's wonderful. Yeah, that is my point. Yeah. And I think just, just people who've been around the track once before, so that they've been through the entire life cycle. Uh, is so important uh, because, you know, when you're dealing with startups that have never done it before, they, they don't know what they don't know. Exactly right, Kate, exactly right. And just for someone to say, you know what, we did that and here's the track for young players. Mm. Um, maybe it doesn't apply to you, but have a think about this. I don't know, that stuff is just invaluable because, um, you know, if you can avoid spending a whole bunch of money or going down a rabbit hole that you don't need to go down, oh, God, that's just like gold for a startup. Yeah, yes, indeed. And that is a really nice and positive note to end on. So thank <laughs> you so much. It's so lovely to see you both. My and pleasure. It's so lovely to see you both as well. And especially you, Annie, I'm so, I hope you, that you get to book a flight soon. I hope you get home before Christmas. That's the plan. Fingers crossed I'll be home before Christmas. I can see Fred and hug you both. And okay. hopefully quarantine at home. So thank you very oh, much. No. Good night. Bye, everyone. Bye.